Welcome everyone to the program. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the Curator of Programming at Planet Word, the Museum of Words and Language in downtown Washington in the Historic Franklin School. That's it behind me. Um, and uh, if you found out about this program because you're already a member, thank you so much for that support. That's how we're able to keep admissions to the museum free, bring in guests, do the kind of work that um, we are looking forward to doing more and more as COVID restrictions lift. If you found out about this program from a friend um, and don't follow Planet Word, you can sign up for the newsletter at the website planetwordmuseum.org uh, or follow us on social media. We're gonna have uh, some pretty exciting stuff coming up this spring. So uh, I hope you all are able to uh, join us for that. I'm delighted to welcome Dennis Duncan. He is joining us from London where he's a professor at University College London. And the book is Index, comma, a history of the, uh, it is completely delightful. You can buy it through the bookshop.org link, um, which supports both Planet Word and local independent bookstores. But I'm also, I'm seeing it all over, Dennis. It's really kind of made a splash. Congratulations. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very, very much. The, there's a lot sort of meta about this book, right? Starting from the title with it being phrased like a index entry. The index itself is fantastic. We will get to that. Um, but I also really sort of enjoyed starting from this premise that uh, anytime you organize anything, you give the example of organizing your kitchen drawers, anytime you sort of uh, place things in categories in your world, you're indexing, which I hadn't thought of it that way. That's, it's a nice idea. I think one thing I keep being asked lately is, well, what is an index? And I think uh, um, if you talk to some of the, the some book indexes here, some professional indexes, and they will have a certain answer to that. But I think at its most abstract, at its most um, conceptual, an index is a way of navigating um, something that we don't know our way around. So it, it, it's um, essentially it's two columns. Um, one column that we do know the order of, and the other column that will give us a location in the in the morass, in, in the sort of big data. So the index, uh, in a way, or, or, or um, alphabetical order even, arrives, arises at the moment where we have the first big data problem. It's the, it's the Library of Alexandria. Um, and the Library of Alexandria has hundreds of thousands of scrolls. And suddenly, that's a nuisance. You want to find something, but there's too much to intuit your way around. Um, but there is something that everybody knows, which is anyone who can need a scroll knows how to read or write. So they know the orders, order of the letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So if you put the names of the things that you're looking for in the order that you know, that's one column, a left-hand column, if you like, one column that we can navigate, and alongside that, there's a reference to a location in the thing that we can't navigate, the things that, that's too big for us to know our way around. That's what an index is. It's a way of, of, of taking something that we do know and using that to navigate something that we, that we don't know. And then we can start to talk about, well, book index is one type of index, that a search engine, Google is another type of index. Um, but uh, at some level, they're all essentially this very, very old structure of two columns um, to navigate the big data, to navigate the thing we don't know by taking the thing that we do know. Oh, just one thing that, that, about the, the Library of Alexandria. So the, the, the Library of Alexandria um, was the centerpiece of, of, of a thing called the Museum. Uh, um, uh, it's kind of like a, a university that, that uh, one of the Ptolemies founded in, in Alexandria at the very start of the third century BC. And it was going to be like a university, an institute to the muses, I say it's like a university, but actually it's um, essentially where we get the word museum from. So I saw Planet Word Museum and I thought, oh yeah, word museum. I must mention that the, the word museum comes from the museum, the, the institute to the muses, which is, which is what, well, what we, all of We always appreciate a little etymology here at the word museum. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, I, I also think that, and you mentioned Google, it was comforting to me to read that throughout this very extensive history, People have bemoaned that indexes are making us stupider. At every um, sort of innovation in the process, there have been, and, and I think you, um, you said, you know, the book index, killing off experimental curiosity since the 17th century. Uh, so this notion that 
simplifying the process is somehow cheating or somehow um, dumbing down the intellectual rigor required. Seems to have been a constant worry. This is not just a digital age concern. Yeah, I think that's right. And first I should say, I, I, I do know that anxiety. I, I sort of pick on um, a writer who I really admire called Nicholas Carr, who wrote a book, uh, who wrote a famous article in 2008 called Is Google Making Us Stupid? And I'm going to say why I disagree with that. But I should say, first of all, that I kind of, we all have this anxiety that, that we're not reading things properly anymore, that, that uh, um, or, or perhaps there's too much to do. And so we take shortcuts. So, so it's not that I'm unfamiliar with that. Um, but what I sort of uncover by, by looking at the history of the index is this thing that feels like it's a presentist anxiety, feels like it's something to do with the digital mode of reading. Well, actually, people have been saying that for 500 years. You can find Erasmus, the great European intellectual, at the start of the 1500s. In 1532, Erasmus writes a book in the form of an index, in the form of an ordered list. And in the preface, he says, well, I had to do it this way because these days that's the only part of the book that people read. And then a hundred years later, you find Galileo being snarky about, ugh, people don't do proper experiments anymore. They just look things up in the index and see if somebody else has written about it and so on and so on and so on. There's a particular moment, which I have an old chapter on in, in the book, of round about the turn of the 1800s where the uh, the idea of index scholarship acquires a load of pejorative terms. If you're, uh, uh, if you're a scholar who uses indexes rather than just has the whole of classical Greek in your head, then you're uh, an index scholar. You're guilty of index raking or alphabetical learning, which is another particularly kind of snide way of saying, oh, you look things up in tables. The truth is, actually, if you look things up in tables, you can do a type of really detailed scholarship that you simply can't do from memory. This is the problem, that there's a new mode of scholarship that is in some ways pedantic, but, but is, is to do with very minute cross-referencing. That word, where else does that word appear? And you simply can't sit in your armchair and, and uh, recount photographically where every word appears in Greek. But if you do that, if you start to cross-reference with tables, you can track the development of the language, you can do all sorts of things that the, the old gentleman scholars couldn't do, but they're incredibly cross about this. Um, so, so that anxiety, um, is Google making us stupid, really just feels like an iteration of, of something that goes back. In my book, I trace it back as far as Plato. Plato says, oh, writing, nobody remembers anything properly anymore. Writing has come along. <laughs> so uh, it's a very, very old thing, although I have to say, of course, I, of course I, I know it, I recognise it. The other thing that I would say, actually, is... is um, I think I used that phrase, nobody reads properly anymore. This is this is at root of, of this, ugh, people don't read properly. One generation uses, uses kind of the ideal of reading as a stick to beat the generation that's coming through. And I really disagree with that. That's something um, that I will take issue with. That when you talk about reading, or when we think about reading, it's, it's an umbrella term for a whole host of activities. When I read a novel, I mean, honestly, when you read a novel, that has so little in common with when you read a tweet or a restaurant menu or a newspaper or a non-fiction book or a street sign or subliminally read an advertisement on the tube or a restaurant menu. You know, all of these are reading um, and yet they all have their own different kind of micro histories and they all uh, really represent different modes of attention. There's nothing wrong with reading a restaurant menu. You know, th there's no proper platonic ideal of reading. And reading has these histories, different types of reading emerge at different points in history. So I do to get my back up and, and, and take issue a little bit with that idea that nobody reads properly anymore. What on earth would that even mean? Um, well, I mean, it's a central <laughs> premise to the museum, you know, that we're, we're not a museum of reading, we're a museum of words and that the joy mm. and wonder of words mm. can be found in so many different formats. And the notion that the only way to enjoy language is to plod through some erudite <laughs> book is to ignore songwriting and speech making mm. and advertising and poetry and menus and all of the other wonderful and joyous and important and powerful ways words are used. So we're right there with you. Exactly. Um, so we, say a little bit more about that as well, which is that um, I think what um, what usually is at root in this idea of proper reading or deep reading is a type of linear reading, reading from page one and, and reading through to the end. And that's certainly appropriate for certain things. That's the way to read a novel, for example, but novel reading 
as, as we say, is, is, is really just one of, of dozens of different modes of reading. And if you read a textbook or a, a recipe book or anything like that from page one through to the end, you're doing it wrong. Give yourself a break. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which brings us back to the index. So I, you know, you we left we left you in Alexandria where um, referencing works on scrolls is not particularly efficient. Uh, it really took the form of a, the book that we know and love today to make indexing uh, make more sense in terms of being yeah. able to look something up by page number. And yeah. I thought it was fascinating that, that, that it sort of, the book index sort of developed simultaneously in two different places at once um, because of the volume of reading going on in those two places. Great, yeah. Two things to say there. Can I, can I just start on that switch from the scroll to the codex? We were talking a moment ago about linear reading, reading a novel, starting at the beginning and, and, and going through to the end. Scrolls are great for that. Scrolls work fine for that. What scrolls aren't good at is looking something up. What we might take a, um, an image from, from the, the age of computing, sc scrolls aren't good for random access. Um, but a book, a book is easy. It's just as easy to open the book on page 150 as it is to open it on page one. So this um, material technology, that taking text and putting it into a different um, material structure, switching from the scroll to what we call the codex, makes a huge difference to how we can use it, the ways that we can read it, the way that we can enter it at sort of uh, multiple entry points. So the index is really an invention that couldn't have happened without the, without the codex um, coming in. The table of contents, the thing at the start that says, here's what you're going to find, you find that back in uh, Latin, uh, um, Latin texts that, that were initially produced on scrolls, but the index doesn't make sense until you get the, the codex. Now, when the index arises, exactly as you say, it's one of these inventions like, like the light bulb or like mathematical calculus that, that is so sort of ripe for its time. The age needs it so much that it gets invented simultaneously twice in two different places. So the index gets invented. We're talking about the year 1230, the start of the 13th century, around right about 1230 in Paris, and in Oxford. And the reasons behind that, as you're saying, it, it's to do with the way that, um, that reading has changed in, in the decades leading up to that. Two things, uh, two new institutions. One is the preaching orders. So reading hitherto had largely taken place in the monasteries. Now monasteries are isolated communities away from the sort of hubbub of, uh, of the cities where people live, where monks live in peace and quiet all their lives. And reading is a fundamental part of your daily practice. Reading and praying, that's essentially what you do and making beer. I think th those are the, the, the jobs uh, of the monks. You will wake up in the night to say your middle of the night prayers. You could do a couple of hours reading then. At mealtime, somebody will be reading to you. So you're constantly, constantly reading or being read to. And the texts that you're reading are very, very limited. You have all the time in the world, if you're a monk, to read. But because of certain heresies in the 12th century, particularly Catharism in the south of France, um, the church realized that these isolated communities um, weren't enough. There needed to be friars. There needed to be um, people out in the cities, out in the communities, preaching, making sure that the flock didn't go astray. So the Dominican order, the Franciscan order, the mendicant friars who lived in the city and went around preaching um, sprang up at the start of the 1200s. If you're going to preach, you're going to have to write sermons. If you're going to have to write sermons, you're going to have to start using books much more efficiently in order to make these engaging, in order to make these memorable. You can't just sit and read the Bible slowly for the rest of your life. You need to think about um, where are you going to find details. So I'll give you an example. Say I'm going to write a sermon on bread. It's going to be about bread and I'm going to start on the New Testament, give us this day our daily bread, and then I'm going to pivot back to the Old Testament with the, the manna from heaven. This is going to be great. It's really lively. It's jumping about the Bible. But in order to do that, either I need to have the whole Bible <laughs> off by heart in my head or an index would be really handy. Where are all the uh, mentions of 
bread. Okay, well, I'll look it up, ding, 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 ding. Then I'm gonna use that one. Then I'm gonna use that one. So the index becomes a tool for the preparation of sermons. And sermons are required because of the preaching orders. Um, this, oh, I'll come back to that in a sec. The other institution we're talking about at the start of the 1200s is the university. Universities have, have sprung up in the last few decades in Bologna in Italy, in Paris, and in Oxford. Universities, just like preaching requires a new mode of speaking, the sermon, well, a, a newish mode of speaking, the universities require a new mode of speaking also, the lecture, a new way of delivering information, one that also has to be nimble with the way that it uses books. We need to jump around. I'm teaching law now. I'm going to mention that bit from the Old Testament, but of course we need to cross-reference it with this other bit where the same thing arrives. So around about the year 1200, possibly about 1204, the Bible is divided up into standard chapters. That's really handy. I can say to my students, turn to Ezekiel chapter three, but um, yes, yeah, sorry, do you see what I mean for, for, for the sort of need for the lecture and the sermon for efficient reading, for, for thinking about the book as not something linear, but something divisible, not something that, that, that is a collection of morsels that you might have to jump around in a, in a sort of not random way, but, but a way that is sparked by connections rather than simple linear order. So the index is um, really a, a child of the universities and the preaching orders. In Paris, um, it's invented uh, by the Dominican friars at the Friary of Saint-Jacques, which is just on the uh, uh, Paris city walls on, on the left bank. And the uh, abbot is a man called Hugh, Hugh of saint Cher, and he gets all of the friars working on this project where they take the Bible, basically explode it into its individual words, and then they put the words into alphabetical order. 10,000 different words, nouns, verbs, adjectives in the Bible, 129,000 locations. What book, what chapter, what section of the chapter do these words exist in? suddenly you just take it's essentially like cutting it up and putting it in a different order um, the words of the bible but in alphabetical order each with a locator to where you can find it as a preaching aid in oxford the index is invented almost the same year by a man called robert gross test gross test is just a, a total polymath uh, an encyclopedic intellect at the university he knows about uh science, he knows about medicine, he knows about theology, he knows about law, his reading is, is completely encyclopedic, and he needs a way of organizing that encyclopedic reading. He reads the Bible, he reads the church fathers, he's translated Aristotle, so he's going into classical or pagan thought, he's even up to date with the latest Arabic science. And what Gross Test does is he has a list of about 400 concepts, um, the Trinity is one, uh, the idea that God exists is another, imagination is another. And for each of these concepts, he has a, like an emoticon, a little symbol. And in his reading, whatever he's reading, when he comes across this concept, if he comes across something to do with imagination, he'll draw a little flower in the margin. So some of Gross Test's books, his old manuscripts still survive. They're in the, the libraries at Oxford and Cambridge. And you can find down the margins, these kind of streams of emoticons, just Gross Test going, here's that idea, here's that idea. Unlike the Parisian index, Gross Test doesn't need to see the exact word. This isn't a word index. But as soon as the concept of imagination comes up, because it could be in several languages, he reads many, many languages. As soon as the concept of imagination comes up, he'll do a little flower in the margin, Later on, he'll go through his margins and keep uh, a larger index of all of his reading. Every time that flower appears, he'll go to the entry for imagination. He'll go, OK, St. Augustine, book four, chapter three, imagination. And what he ends up with is a subject index, an index of these 440 concepts and everywhere they appear. This is the man who's read everything. So it's, it survives on a single piece of parchment, no, a single parchment codex in the municipal lion, uh, library in, in Lyon in France. There's only one copy of it, um, but it's, it's, set, it's like a kind of parchment Google. This is the person who's read everything. And every time he finds a concept, 
he makes a note of where it appears. So you can find every instance, if you like, of the Trinity or imagination or that God exists on this uh, parchment in, in Leon 800 years later. It's brilliant. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about the difference between uh, a concordance and a subject. Do you know what? Actually, I might do something completely different because I came prepared to do a little bit. I did, wasn't sure if I was going to do a lecture or a conversation. So I'm actually going to show you something um, fun for a sec. Becca, I'm so sorry. I'm going off piste here. I'm just going to show some slides. Um, I was going to talk about, about a bit about snark in indexes. And I was going to show here are some slides just in case <laughs> just in case you wanted me to give a lecture um but the thing that i wanted to show you was these two men this is uh, norman mailer um and william f buckley jr i managed to find a picture of, of mailer pretending he was boxing he wasn't hard to do actually there's loads of these pictures of mailer looking like he's boxing but i, I wanted to set this up as a kind of spat now what's happened is the year is um 1965 and the elections are on for mayor of New York. William F. Buckley decides to throw his hat into the ring between the Republican and Democratic uh, candidate. Buckley is a, an outside shot and in fact he's, he's some distance I think to the right of the Republican candidate. He doesn't have a chance but he does liven up the debate. One thing he also does is he pulls the whole debate right which works in the Republican candidate's favour. When he loses um, the election. He's really made a name for himself with his, his sort of amusing oratory. What was his quip? He has this line about somebody asks him, um, what would you do if you actually won? And he says, demand a recount. Um, but anyway, when he, when he loses the election, he takes some time out and he writes a book called The Unmaking of a Mayor about his experiences running for mayor. And one thing that he does is he uh, asks Norman Mailer, his sort of frenemy, Norman Mailer, whether he'd be allowed to reproduce some of their correspondence in the book. And Mailer says no. And Buckley is annoyed by this. Anyway, the book comes out and Buckley sends a copy to Norman Mailer. He hasn't included the correspondence, but he has said that Mailer wasn't going to let me do it. Um, and as a way of kind of getting back at Norman Mailer, Buckley cracks this joke. What he does is in the index, alongside the entry for Mailer, Norman, he writes, hi. <laughs> and what this is, it's a kind of um, kind of gotcha. It's a kind of uh, nod, wink at, at Norman Mailer's narcissism. What he knows is that Mailer is going to turn to the back to see if he's in it. Um, and this is a sort of anecdote that, that works from the moment that Buckley sends the book off, he can tell people, I wrote this in Norman Mailer's book. I saw him looking himself up. What a massive narcissist. <laughs> it's a really nice joke. And when I've been writing this book about the index, one thing that I've talked about quite a lot is the way that the index becomes weaponized, that there's uh, index snark is a thing for the last um, 300 years. But this is the anecdote that most people have told me. People say, ah, you're writing a book about the index. Have you included uh, Buckley and Mailer? And for a long time, I thought that it was an urban myth. But um, then I discovered that Mailer's library is, is still stored at the in the archives at the Harry Rans Ransom Centre. So all of Mailer's books have been preserved. And I got in touch with the librarian there and said, would you mind finding the unmaking of a mayor, and would you mind turning to the index at the back, and would you mind seeing if this story is true, and sure enough it is, so this is my favourite thing, my favourite index snark anecdote, that this actually turns out to be true, but there's just one other thing, one uh, final note that I would say about this, when you bring out a book, um, all of the images, all of the photographs, paintings, illustrations, um, all have to be cleared. You pay, uh, oh, I have to say, you have to pay a lot of money to galleries and archives uh, and everybody to, to reproduce all of the images that you use. Not only do you have to pay to the galleries, the archives, you also have to get permission if the author has died within the last 70 years. Now, the Harry Ransom Centre were very generous in letting me use this, but actually, because it has William F. Buckley's handwriting, 
It's also, it's not just Norman Mailer's book, but it's a Buckley manuscript. And so I had to get permission from William F. Buckley's estate to ask if I could reproduce it. Now his son is a man called Christopher Buckley. Very, very generously, after some correspondence, he said, yes, of course, you can, you can reproduce that. I ask one thing only, when the book comes out, please could you send me a copy of it? And the book came off the press last month and I sent a copy to Christopher Buckley, but I couldn't resist a little bit of my own snark. So here it is uh, in the copy that I sent <laughs> Christopher Buckley. Hi. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Index snark uh, from the year 2022. Um, I talked earlier about the way that um, in the abstract, conceptually, an index is really two columns. You have your alphabetical list, the terms that you want to look up, um, and then you have the locations where you find them. Now, we said alphabetical order or the use of alphabetical order really emerged in the Library of Alexandria in the, the third century BC. But the page number really comes into its own a lot later. Now, when I was talking about the 13th century, the birth of the index, we're back in the era of the manuscript, the medieval manuscript, where every copy of a book is literally that. Somebody had to copy it out by hand. Manuscript, we we're talking about etymologies earlier, manuscript means hand writing. So a manuscript is something that has to be written out by hand, copied out by hand. So number one, books are very expensive. And number two, they take an awfully long time to produce. But the third thing that we, we might not have thought about is that they come in all shapes and sizes. We might have the same text. I have a, you have a book and I want a copy of it. So I take it to a monk and I say, will you copy this out? And hopefully he pays very close attention to getting the words exactly right. But he doesn't pay any attention to keeping things on the same page. Your book might be that size. My book might be that size. So when he's copying my book out, he could be doing two pages of yours to one of mine or vice versa. So indexes in the 13th, 14th century, um, ones that use page numbers are really copy specific. They don't work if you, um, if you just copy them out. And I actually found one in a library in Cambridge um, where the, the scribe, a man who he signed his name, bless him, this is the 1380s, called John Lutton, a monk called John Lutton. He's copied out over many months, a huge history book. It gets to the end and he says, John Lutton copied this book out. And then he realizes he's still got to do the index. So he copies out the index, but he actually literally copies out the index, copies out the numbers. Now these numbers don't work because he's copied it into a slightly different sized book. And so I go through it, trying to find the things that he's talking about. And sure enough, they are in the book. They're just not where he says they are. So the whole index is basically like a, um, if you have a web page and every time you click on a link, it's, it's full of links and every single one goes 404 page not found. This is John Lutton's uh, history of England from the 1380s, a whole load of broken links. So the crucial thing is the thing that happens in the 1450s, which is the invention of the printing press. Now, suddenly you set a page of type, you ink it up, you rub a piece of paper on it, there's your sheet ink it up, rub another piece of paper on it. The next page is identical. We've got an edition. We've got, uh, um, you and I can have copies of, of something from the same print run. And I can say, uh, you're gonna love what's on page 56, knowing that your page 56 is the same as mine. We haven't been able to do that before in the whole history of books. Your page 56 is the same as my page 56. Now we can start to do footnotes. Now we can start to use page numbers in indexes. Every single book is liable to have an index because it has, local, we don't need Bible chapters anymore. Every page has something that we can use. So round the turn of, of, of the 1500s, but by the start of the 1500s, we find indexes in history books, cookery books, uh, gardening books, medical books, um, religious books, poetry books. There's even a very famous Italian poem by a man called Ariosto. The poem's called Orlando Furioso, and it has a scene in it. This is written in 1516, and it has a scene in it where a knight is given a spell book by a fairy, and it's like Chekhov's gun. You know he's going to need that. Anyway, a few verses later, sure enough, he needs to cast a spell, and he says, uh, I knew exactly where to look up the spell because I just turned to the index. 
So by 1516, even fairy spell books have got indexes because the page number has completely transformed the standardizing of the page. But I thought I might just read a little bit because the first printed page number is in a small sermon printed in Cologne in 1470. It's nothing very special. And the libraries don't treat it as something very special. If I go to a library and I say, please, can I look at a Gutenberg Bible and a Shakespeare first folio, they will, <laughs> they will tell me, maybe not as politely as this, but they will tell me to make an appointment. Um, but uh, the, <laughs> the sermon with the first printed page number, you can go into the British Library or the Bodleian Library in Oxford and call it up. And in 20 minutes, it'll be sitting on your desk next to your laptop, next to your bottle of water, just there, the whole thing. It, it blows my mind um, what an important document this is. And yet we don't quite treat it as such. So I thought I'd just read you my encounter with the sermon, the first printed page number. I'm in the Bodleian Library in Oxford with a small printed book open on the desk in front of me. This is the text of a sermon. It's printed in 1470 in Cologne at the print shop of a man called Arnold Tohernan. The book is no larger than a paperback. Uh, and the text itself is short, just 12 leaves, 24 pages. Um, but sitting here in the library with the book before me and opened on its first pages, I think the most intense experience that I've had of the archival sublime, that sense of disbelief that something so significant, something of such conceptual magnitude should be here on my desk among my own workaday effects, my laptop, my notebook, the pencil. It feels astonishing that I should be allowed to pick it up, hold it, turn its pages as if it were a novel that I just purchased at the train station. Why is it not under glass, sealed off, labelled and exhibited where crowds of school children might look but not touch? There's a name for this feeling, Stondhal syndrome, named after the French novelist who on a visit to Florence described the palpitations he experienced at being so close to the tombs of the Renaissance masters. I feel I'm on the verge of tears. The sermon was written by Werner Rollevink, a monk from the Cologne Charter House. Rollevink become famous for writing the Fasciculus Temporum or the Little Bundle of Dates, a history of the world from the first day to the creation of the creation to the bleeding edge of the pre present, in his case, the 3rd of May, 1481, the date which Rolovink informs us the Ottoman emperor, Mehmet II, went to hell for his wickedness against Christianity. But the lengthy and complex fasciculus was still a work in progress when Rolovink penned his short sermon to be preached on the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the 21st of November. If the truth be told, however, it's neither Rolovink nor his preaching that make this book special, not for me. It's something else. Something about the book itself there in the right hand margin, halfway down, a single large capital J. The ink has uh, bled slightly, the impression slightly too strong, so the letters a little smudgy without the detail and the clarity of the Gothic lettering in the main text block. Nevertheless, I love this J all the more for its blurriness. I'd rather it were this way, characterful, let's call it, than the other J, crystalline, a perfect impression, just to the left of it in the main text, beginning the name Joachim. This is what I'm talking about, the index halfway down, the, 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 num the letter J halfway down in the right-hand margin. Our marginal J has nothing to do with Joachim. It's pure coincidence that they should appear side by side like this. You see there's another J, a clearer J, just along, it, along from it in the text. It's pure coincidence. In fact, our J is not really a J at all. It's there as a numeral, one, announcing that this is the first leaf of the book. Our J is the first printed page number. It will revolutionize the way that we use books. And in doing so, it will become such a commonplace that it will disappear almost from view, hiding in the plain sight at the edge of every page. 
thank you very much for doing the reading. I really, I, I can't recommend the book enough. I understand that um, I work at a word museum and, and my, you know, complete delight in the way people use words might be unusual, but um, your delight in the way people use words comes through so much. Um, and just that moment when you, when you saw that first printed page number, there's not that many people who would be overwhelmed by that moment. So um, your, so much. your enthusiasm absolutely <laughs> comes through. Um, this difference between a concordance and a subject index, mm. the, um, uh, you know, going back to whether you're simply documenting the frequency of certain terms or whether you're making some judgment, right? Um, going back to those initial um, inventions, uh, if, if you want to, for instance, mention every time the Bible mentions imagination, uh, you're making a judgment call about whether something is imaginary or um, whether, which is different from simply documenting the instance of the word imagination. Um, and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about that because I think it then leads into this notion I find completely delightful, which is weaponizing indexes <laughs> and <laughs> sure, using them yeah. to make a point. So that's, that's such an important distinction. So they both get invented at the same time, the, the subject index and the word index. But as you say, one of them is, is just a list of the words, but, but in a different order. Take the words or something, put it in alphabetical order. Whereas the subject index is mediated. It, it's a reader deciding I think this is the concept that's being discussed here. And it has really important repercussions. There's a moment in the 1540s, this is the end of King Henry VIII's reign, that there's a, a period of, of quite uh, severe religious paranoia in England, where a man called John Marbeck um, is arrested. He's a singer, he's a chorister at St George's Chapel, which is in, in Windsor Castle. Um, and he gets arrested by the religious authorities, Henry VIII's religious authorities, who suspect him of being a heretic, who suspect him of being a member of a set who, uh, a sect who are followers of John Calvin. And they search his house, um, take him off to prison in London, search his house. And what they find there is that he's been compiling an index to the Bible. And I love this detail. He's got as far as the letter L. He's been starting at the beginning. He's got, <laughs> up, he's gone from A to L. And they say to him, John Marbeck, you are not educated. Um, so we think you're uh, an underling. We think you can give us the names of uh, more senior members of the sect that you're in. So, so he's put under severe inquisition. And they say the index that you're compiling is probably heretical. Whose instructions are you taking? What are you suppressing? What ideas, concepts are being, you, you know, having their levels turned up and their levels dialed down in this heretical index to the Bible. And John Marbeck says, well, no, I don't, I don't know anyone. Um, and in fact, this index isn't a subject index. I'm not making any decisions. I'm just translating the Latin concordance. So I'm just using a Latin concordance to the Bible that's been around for, for 300 years and looking up the words in it, finding what they are in the English Bible and using that to do an English concordance. And I say, well, Marbeck, you're not clever enough. You haven't had the Latin education to do that. We don't believe you. And it's looking pretty much like he's going to be burned. He's, the, the, the penalty will be death. And uh, Marbeck uh, um, is in real trouble until he has an idea. He says, well, listen, you know, I only got up to the letter L. Um, so if you bring me some pens, some paper, a Latin concordance, and you set me some words from the second half of the alphabet, I will show you that I can do this, that I just look them up in the Latin thing. I know enough Latin to find my way in an index. And then I take the English words and I put that into my index. And the bishop, these are the senior bishops, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Winchester, but they can't deny his logic. And they say, okay. And, <laughs> and they give him a knight and they set him some words from the second half of the alphabet. And sure enough, when they come back, Marbeck has done exactly as he says, he's indexed these words and he escapes, he's let off. They keep the index 
Um, but he, he lives, he survives for another three or four decades, becomes a successful musician. He also starts from scratch with his index again, publishes it about 10 years later with a preface where he's very careful to say, this is um, purely based. <laughs> <laughs> based on translating the Latin concordance. But, um, but to your point about the difference between a subject index and a concordance, um, it really, people, people's, people's lives have hung on the difference between a subject index where you might be doing something funny, you might be doing some interpretation, and that interpretation might be dangerous, and a concordance which is, which is neutral, which is just a reorganization. Of, it reminds me, I, I think I probably said earlier today about the, the, the way that um, Google is an index. Google is just an index of, of, of the web. Google say this, that, that when you type something into Google, it doesn't search the web, it just search Google's, searches Google's index of the web. The web searching happens all the time in the background, but your search terms just looks up in an index. Now, that same anxiety about, okay, well, who is, in charge here, who's, who's, um, how is this being mediated um, is, is very present. I'll give you an example of, of the, exactly this, this anxiety um, that Marbeck um, was lucky with in, in the 1540s, but, but it hasn't really gone away. Here is uh, somebody that you will be familiar with. Um, this is Donald Trump. Uh, he says, Google search results for Trump news shows only the viewing reporting of fake news media. In other words, they have it rigged. So Google is rigged, says Donald Trump. Here's that idea that, well, who's controlling the index? He goes on in, in the text below, he says, Google and others are suppressing the voices of conservatives. They're controlling what we can and cannot see. Now, that's exactly what the, 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 the bishops were saying to John Marbeck. This isn't a concordance. This is an index. You're controlling what we can and cannot see. Funny thing, when I put these slides together, I was able to find a, an image of the tweet for the first part, but, but for some very well-documented reasons, the tweets don't all exist anymore. So, so I had to type out the, uh, the second part there. Anyway, I believe Google in this instance was exonerated by some uh, very industrious scholars working for The Economist who showed that this wasn't the case. But that anxiety that indexes can be rigged, a subject index isn't a concordance, a subject index is not neutral. Perhaps it's it, it, Google and others are suppressing certain voices, if you see what I mean. Well, and, and there are examples of if the indexer is not the author or if the indexer is trying to make fun of the author or if the indexer is um, trying to subvert the author in some way that you can, through the use of a subject index, um, absolutely make an entirely different point if that's what you want to do. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this really comes, <laughs> this really comes into being at the round about the turn of the 18th century. Um, what happens, I, I think, with, with, with many pieces of technology, once once people really get the hang of them, um, people can start to customize. Once everybody knows how something works, you can start to play off it. You can start to ironize it. You can start to sort of um, customize it to, to different needs. So the index by the end of the 1600s is such a well-known um, part of a book that people can start to ironize it, even weaponize it. Now I mentioned earlier that there's an anxiety that people aren't doing scholarship properly anymore, that people aren't reading properly anymore. These index scholars looking things up. And so um, the first attack index, if you like, is ironically designed to attack one of these index scholars. It's, it's called an index to Dr. Bentley, Dr. Bentley being a, a classicist at Cambridge. And it's a whole, there's a whole book about what a terrible person Bentley is and how he's an index scholar and he, 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 this isn't proper work. And at the back, there's an index of the characteristics of Dr. Bentley. So the, the entries are things like his pedantry, his niceness to foreigners. The, these days, uh, well, I'm talking about the early 18th century, though I could be talking about the 2020s. Um, it's almost a crime to be too enthusiastic in this country about people on the continent. Anyway, Dr. Bentley is accused of this, and the index points to all of the moments where Dr. Bentley is, 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 is a little bit anti-Brexit or um, <laughs> a little bit pedantic, or uh, apparently claims to have read books that he can't possibly have read, which, which I'm sure we all know how that feels. Um, but anyway, this starts to catch on. So a couple of years later, the year is 1705 now, and in Parliament, a young man called William Bromley 
I say young, he's in his 30s, is running for the top position, Speaker of the House of Commons. Now, he's in his 30s. Ten years ago, when he really was a young man, he'd done what young aristocratic men used to do, uh, a kind of gap year. He, he, he'd gone on what was called the Grand Tour, a uh, sort of educational um, tour around France and Italy. And when he got back, he wrote a little book about it, Remarks on the Grand Tour by William Bromley. And nothing happened. This 1692, uh, it, it sank without a trace. But 1705, 13 years later, when he really wants the top job, suddenly a second edition of this book appears. This is three days before the election. The timing is incredible. We think that we only invented sort of precision timing with, with blogging and tweets, but actually the in the days of print, you could still do really precise timing. Three days is just long enough for satire to reach, reach kind of peak attention. Enough people will have seen it, but it hasn't gone stale yet. Three days before the election, a second edition comes out and it's identical to the first. The only difference is it has an index and the index makes fun of the main text. The index points to all the moments that Bromley is naive or childish or a bit sympathetic to Catholics or, uh, or, or all of these things. Mostly it makes fun of his poor grammar. There's a, there's a lot of stuff where <laughs> he's just mocked for basically being juvenile. The idea is essentially, would you want this guy, a speaker of the House of Commons? And sure enough, Bromley loses the election. And he has his own copy of this book. He manages to get hold of one. Um, and on the flyleaf, he writes this incredibly petulant thing going, this is an example of the malicious behaviour of the Whigs that cost me an election. Bromley is in no doubt at all that he lost the election on account of this index satire. And what we find then is over the next decade, it catches on. If you want to undermine your political opponents, well, if you're in politics, you better not write any books because what's going to happen is your <laughs> opponents are simply going to publish an index where oh, you can't write a book that's, that's, that, that doesn't have any weak points, that doesn't have uh, you know, any sort of uh, weak chains in it. Um, and the index is, is a kind of ripe place to, to mock these. There's something about index style as well that, that um, Poloni Polonius in, in Hamlet says, uh, brevity is the essence of wit. And index entries are brevity, you know, um, incarnate. So, so the index is, is a really sort of nifty way to be snarky. It's already got a syntax that, that has a, a sort of snappiness, snarkiness built into it. Well, which brings me to the index of your book about the index, because um, first of all, you do, in fact, start with a computer generated concordance. It is tedious. It is pedantic you happily dispense with that somewhere in the middle of the A's and go on to an index developed by an actual professional indexer, which is delightful. I mean, I don't know if she just went rogue or if you two worked together <laughs> to make it what it is, but there's, um, there's inside jokes. There is uh, little reminders that she is brilliant and underpaid. It is, <laughs> there's, there's a joke and uh, you know, it's um, Dennis comma Duncan, look for Duncan comma Dennis. You know, it's it, it just, it's so clever. And um, we have a question in the Q&A about professional indexers. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about her and how that all came about. Oh, she, she totally went rogue, didn't she? Uh, <laughs> um, so the, 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 what I wanted to do in this book was to have two indexes. So at the moment, um, you can you can jump through any document with with Control F. If you're reading on a Kindle or, or on a tablet or on, on a screen, um, the concordance is built in. The concordance it, it, you don't need monks to produce your concordance anyway. The concordance has been abstracted from the text and is now in the platform. Whether it's Adobe or whether it's your Kindle, there no matter how many texts you load into it, it'll automatically have a concordance. Add a new text. It'll automatically, you'll automatically be able to jump through it looking for the word that you want. Now, that's not the same as a subject index. If you have a, a book worth its salt, if you have a good nonfiction book, um, the, the subject index does something additional. It, it, it understands what you want to what, what you might want to look for and how you might not remember exactly how it was phrased. Um, well, the example I always give is, is that the most in the Bible, the, the most famous story about forgiveness in the Bible is the parable of the prodigal son. But that parable doesn't include the word forgiveness. 
So that's a problem. It doesn't include the word mercy, it doesn't include the word prodigal. So control F isn't going to help you there. Um, it, it takes somebody to, to understand, ah, forgiveness, maybe you're thinking of the prodigal son. Um, that's what the subject indexer does. They try to guess, you know, like Robert Gross test with his flowers and imagination. This is the concept, even if it's expressed in different words. Um, so at the moment, there's software that can produce book indexes. And I've had a book, um, I was made aware of it to my horror when a publisher sent me an index to a book that, that, um, that just wasn't fit for purpose. And I realized it, it must, must have been compiled using this kind of software. And I wanted to show how that works, how it's, it's good at some things, but you know, it's good if you want to know like all the places where I use the word alas, um, but that, that's, not, that's not how a, a reader is going to want to use my book. So a human indexer um, will do a good job. So, so when I got Paula to do the index, I wanted two things. One, I thought, well, a book about indexes, I need a really good indexer. I need somebody who um, has sort of prestige in the professional body, the Society of Indexes. And I knew Paula had been on the board of the Society of Indexes. Um, so that was that box ticked. But also I'd met Paula, I'd met the Society, and Paula had always struck me as, as, as somebody who had a really good sense of humour about her. And I thought, because we have sort of playfulness in the book or talk about playful indexes, I wonder if I can get somebody who can do that as well, who can, number one, make an index that's functional, that's really good and works, but number two, absolutely stamp it with their personality. Paula is training to be a cryptic crossword setter. And I think that way of thinking of anagrams and acrostics and puzzles um, is, runs through her index like like a like a stick of rock doesn't it it's 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 totally stamped with her personality it contrasts really well with the crap functional computerized index one other thing to say about the the, com the computer index i said that the index was invented in paris by a man called hugh of saint cher um c-h-e-r it's a little village in 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 the south of france now when i ran the software I had a look through the computerized index. I was surprised to find that Sher appeared a lot in my book. Um, I was thinking, well, I don't remember saying anything about her, um, but in fact, it was <laughs> it was the the software taking Hugh oh, of Sher. Oh, I see, taking C H E R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As uh, in the seventies pop star. Wow. In life after right. love. I don't think I mentioned that. But, um, <laughs> Sure enough, it's uh, the index is telling me that, that she's on about 15 pages. So um, uh, Paula, would <laughs> Paula would never make that mistake. Right. My, my favorite bit of her index, and I don't want to ruin anything for people who haven't read it, but there's this whole running gag about, um, you know, uh, fruitless endeavor, see wild goose chase. Yeah, you get to yeah, wild yeah. goose chase and you say, see fool's <laughs> errand and you go to fool's errand and it just it keeps going going on through. Um, so we are almost out of time. I do want to ask, somebody has asked the question in the uh, Q&A, mm. what will your next project be? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think that I'd like to write a book about English literary eccentrics. So really, I came to this project from uh, uh, my background is in French literature, a group called the Ulipo, a group of avant-garde writers formed in Paris in 1960 famous for Georges Perec's novel without the letter E. So that kind of playfulness. Um, now in French literary culture, you have your traditional canon of French literature. You have Racine and Moliere and Proust and so on. Everybody studies those. But since the Surrealist, almost 100 years ago, the Surrealist did a really good job in sort of excavating a counter canon, outsider artists, people who hadn't been discovered um, doing wacky things um, without even really realizing it was wacky, but, but a, a long centuries old tradition of strange eccentric literature. And we don't have that in, in English literature. It, it's funny because the English, the French, I think, think of us as, as a nation of eccentrics. And yet we haven't really produced a, a canon of um, outsider artists. You might think of Lewis Carroll or, or Edward Lear, but even they're quite famous. They're quite sort of well known. So I think my next project would be slightly more literary than this one, but to, um, to write a history of literary eccentricity, people who are outsider artists writing strange, um, wacky, undiscovered literature. Wow. Well, we'll have to have you back. Um, 
Thank you so much. I can't recommend the book enough. Um, Dennis, it's just been a joy to spend most of an hour with you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>